To formalize just thinking about all these different components, uh, there's a helpful paper called the ML test score, which is really by the same people at Google or a you know, overlapping set of people that published the work that we found useful yesterday and that Xavier actually pointed to also in his lecture yesterday, which is machine learning, the high interest credit card of technical debt, hidden technical debt in machine learning systems, and uh, rules of machine learning, best practices for machine learning engineering. <clears throat> so what is the source of complexity? Well, when you're writing traditional software, you have your code, and then you deploy it. It's a running system. You have unit tests for the code. Maybe you have integration tests for how it interfaces with other systems that are running. And then as it's running, you just monitor and make sure it's still up. In a machine learning software system, you have your code, and you have unit tests for your code, but the code actually uh, outputs something that is a process, which is model training. And model training is a combination of your code and data. And then the result of that is what gets deployed as a running system. And the running system responds to other data that comes in. So there's a bunch of other tests now. There's the data tests, data skew tests, maybe prediction monitoring, and the integration tests have to cover more kind of surface area. If we want to map our system onto this system, then I think it kind of goes like this. The ML infrastructure tests are tests of the training system. The model tests are tests of the prediction system. All these data skew monitoring and prediction monitoring tests are monitoring of the serving system. And then your data tests are something about your data. I want to just read the, the, the machine learning rubric, the test score. So for data, you want to capture feature expectations in a schema. Uh, all the features are beneficial. The no features cost is too much. Features adhere to meta level requirements. So that might mean like there's some business reason to have a specific feature and you obey that. The data pipeline has appropriate privacy controls. Uh, so you're not leaking sensitive data. New features can be added quickly. All input feature code is tested. For model tests, model specs are reviewed and submitted. Offline and online metrics correlate. All hyperparameters have been tuned. The impact of model staleness is known. A simpler model is not better. Model quality is sufficient on important data slices. The model is tested for considerations of inclusion. These, uh, this refers to like, the bias um, problem that we've seen. The ML infrastructure tests, training is reproducible. Model specs are unit tested. The machine learning pipeline is integration tested. Model quality is validated before actually putting it in production. The model is debuggable. The models are canaried before serving. That refers to uh, deploying a small part of your production workflow or your production predictions. A small part of them should be made by the new model before all of the predictions are made by the new model. That way, if you detect something going wrong, it only affects a small part of the users, and you can roll it back. So that's the last one. Models can be rolled back. For monitoring, dependency changes result in notification. Uh, data invariants hold for inputs. Training and serving are not skewed. So that refers to the data distribution. Uh, models are not too stale. Models are numerically stable. Computing performance is not regressed. That refers to how fast it takes to actually run the model. Prediction quality has not regressed. So to score the test, uh, basically like a zero point is so let's say you know, we're considering a given machine learning thing in production. Uh, we consider it on all these, sorry, on all these um, aspects. And if they get a zero in all the points, then really it's kind of a research project, but not really a productionized system. If they get a five or above, then that's exceptional levels of automated testing and monitoring. And uh, between you know, around two to four, it's there's some tests, but it's also possible that we can automate more. So what the authors did is they interviewed 36 different teams. This is a couple of years ago at, at Google with a machine learning system in production. And they scored them on the rubric that they, that they devised. And the average score across all the teams was less than one for, for, for basically all these um, dimensions. And so that means you know, there's a lot of room to grow. This is mostly aspirational. This isn't like. It's not like every team at Google definitely follows this whole rubric uh, to the T. 
but it's an aspirational set of rules that we should all aspire to and think about hard. I want to pause here before getting into the details. Can you give examples of privacy controls in the pipeline? So you might have a data you might have a data source that has something sensitive about the user and something not sensitive about the user and you only care about the part that's not sensitive, so maybe the action that they took on the site, and the sensitive thing is their name. But in the original data format, they're just in the same database or the same table or the same log. When you feed it to the model, uh, it would be wise to potentially mask out this, just drop the column with the student with the username and only leave the user action. Or maybe you want to map a username to just some kind of ID that can't be uh, de-anonymized. So we talked about a bunch of different systems. So for training, for de testing, for deployment, um, how do you recommend splitting those into repos, or do you recommend just having one repo to cover everything? I'm just going to reconstruct this thing. So. I think the question of whether to have multiple repos or a single mono repo is just a general software engineering question that different people have different answers to. I tend to want everything in one repo, and that's also the answer for a lot of companies like Google. Um, everything is in one repo, so that means, let's say you have a machine learning system that's eventually deployed to mobile, so that means the mobile code is going to be in the same repo as the model code as the training code. So it's all in the same repo. So the reason that is nice is because, let's say you update the, um, the version of the mobile operating system that you want to support. Now your model breaks. So you can f that has to be fixed potentially in the model code, not in the mobile code. So if you have the same set of continuous integration and it's all in one repo, then you'll find, up about, find out about it. You can fix it right there. A reason why it's not a good idea is because the mobile app is very separate from your model, and so why should it be in the same repo? So you might have two different repos, and then something will break uh, in, in the mobile repo. They'll have to submit an issue to the model repo, and then when the model repo is updated, you'll have to submit an issue to the mobile app repo for them to increase the version of the model that, you, that you're using. So I think that's kind of more back and forth. Uh, I think it's not worth it. It's nice to just try to have stuff as much as possible in one repo. But I can see the, I can see the downsides too. You know, it gets, there's a lot in one repo. I can actually add an entry. Yes, we will have one single repo, but it's more question, not about how many individuals you have, but what is your output artifact? So it has both, both system, which actually consider how, how many artifacts you kind of get from each repository. So in this case, you have one artifact for mobile, one artifact for your site, so it's not that you have a huge kind of binary, you kind of split it on binary level. Yeah, that's a good point. So the, a single repo can produce multiple artifacts, uh, and that, yeah, <laughs> so. Basically, you know, the fundamental problem is that things develop at different rates, and dependencies change at different rates, at different parts in the stack. And dependencies might affect things downstream of them in a way that is very hard to predict and involves different teams of people. If the different teams of people work in different repositories, then the way they communicate with each other is through versioning, and everything has to be rigidly versioned. If the different teams of people work in the same repository, then they don't necessarily have to version as much, and they can kind of iterate faster because they will see that something this team changed broke something in this other team immediately and at the cost of just the bigger repo. Yeah, I mean, bigger repo is added overhead because then you have to be more careful about pushing to it. There's a bigger set of tests that you have to run. Um, so in some cases, that can make you move slower as well. Um, but if you have to split into multiple repos, then uh, I could actually see the training system be a separate thing because the same training process could apply to multiple different models, and then your different models could live in different repos. And potentially, yeah. 
That's all I want to say about that. Two questions on the ML test paper, um, ML test score paper. Mm -hmm. um, two things it refers to are model spec and then also numerical instability. Can you give examples of both of those? So that's probably in the bottom right corner. Number five models are numerically stable. So that would be, there's possibilities of like overflows in your computations that depending on the exact input might or might not happen. Um, I think that's what this would refer to. You just want to make sure that there's no possibility that your model actually drastically changes the computation that it does simply because the input that you feed into it is, is slightly different. Was that, that was one question. Was there another one? Um, yeah, on the, the uh, model specs are unit tested. So what, do, what are model specs? Model specs are reviewed and submitted. Um, so this kind of framework refers more to the, it, it refers to the deep learning workflow, but it also refers to the more old school feature engineering, you know, logistic regression type of workflow where, and that you can kind of see that in the data tests. It, like, it, it really talks about features. And um, so some of this stuff isn't necessarily relevant to us. I think a model spec in this case would be something that just explains like what features it has to use, what output it um, would produce. And that is basically an agreement between different teams, right? So if I'm responsible for some model that lives in between data that some other teams generate, and I output something that another team is going to use downstream in their own model or in their own application, that's how we communicate. I tell you what I expect from the features, and I'll tell you what I'll output from that. How would you approach this if you're a resource constrained? Like, which of these things would you prioritize, and which ones would you cut? Um, out of all these tests, I think, so for me, training is reproducible is number one uh, in the ML infrastructure test. Because if you can't get back to where you were, then, then you're just not doing software engineering, right? Um, that would definitely be number one. Number two would probably be in monitoring tests. And there, I think there's a huge danger of feeling like once you've trained the model, you're done. And you just kind of deploy it, and then you stop paying attention to it. And that can be dangerous because something about the way data gets into your production system can change, and it might be out of your control. So maybe, let's say you're doing uh, predictions on images, and at some point, like when you trained, the resolution was, I don't know, 600 by 800. But then at some point in production, some other team decided to change it to 1,200 by 1,600. And now your model's breaking, but you don't even know because you, assume, you wouldn't assume that that's going to happen. And so I think some part of this monitoring test is very important. Potentially, dependency changes result in a notification to you. Or um, some kind of data invariant. That would alert you that the, the shape of your data changed. Or the training and serving distributions are not skewed, because that would also be reflected in this problem. But something that handles that kind of problem. And then the third thing is, uh, I'd say, model quality sufficient on important data slices, number six on model tests. So I think that's kind of underappreciated in, in, uh, in people coming from academic backgrounds. So in, in academia, you have your data set that everyone is working on, right? So like Microsoft Cocoa, everyone's working on that. And you measure your, the, the, the goodness of your model is measured by a metric, like what is your you know, area under the precision recall curve on the segmentation task, 83%. The next year you get 84%, that's a win. But in the real world, that does not necessarily translate to a user experience that is, that is good. So a good user experience might actually be that you never mess up on these like basic things. And it doesn't really matter to me how well you do on these things that I perceive to be complicated as a user. And so that, to me, is captured by the word important data slices. There's different levels of importance for different uh, pieces of data. Like in a self-driving car, very important to not run over a pedestrian. Probably not that important to know exactly where the lane is if it's just uh, a one-lane road, right? Or exactly how wide the lane is in a, 
in a, on a road. So that's kind of where I see uh, what I call functionality tests play a role, which is the crucial examples that you absolutely must get right, actually codify them as a set of examples and not just as part of a validation test where the actual performance on them is going to get hidden behind a metric. So yeah, the, the top three, training is reproducible. Something about knowing when, monitor, when your production system is going to break. And then um, uh, testing model quality on important data. Yeah, maybe let's That's it. On. Cool. So 